and all the time. And I'm a witness. Turn to page 498, and we're going to sing that one twice, Every Day with Jesus. How about that? I'm sorry. <laughs> 498. We'll go through it twice. certainly true if you know the Lord. A lot of things get old in life, you know. When you, yeah, besides us, Tommy, you know, our cars get old and our houses get old and our joints get old. And uh, you can go to the same restaurant over and over again. First time you go, it's great. Second time, it's pretty good. You keep going and going and you say, I want something different. But you know what? Jesus is the only thing that satisfies eternally. He gets sweeter as the days go by. That's a joy to know Him. As we pray tonight, I want to hear your prayer request, and the Lord does too. Okay, Turner family. Martha's having surgery tomorrow. Okay. All right. Um, and it's going to a young 20 year old that well, she's in her early 20s, 22, 23 years old. Um, she went for a sonogram for her baby and at 18 weeks and found a basketball sized tumor and that it was cancerous. They had to do the emergency surgery. She has a baby called this large in the her lower abdomen bowel uh, with a tube out of it, but the baby was safe. And um, it's doing fine. And so um, that this, this is going to be a bad It's Lindsay Tysander. All right. Lindsay Tysander. Okay, you remember that mm -hmm. name? Who else? Who else? Did you say something? Okay, the Graham family. And unspoken request. Keep Lee in your prayers. Lee had to go back to Butte uh, Monday night. He, he fell some, uh, again at Brendan Benny's, and they had to have him transported to Thomasville and then again to Butte. His platelets dropped to seven again. And so he's there, and uh, talked to Ben this morning. He had had a fair night. He did pass out again last night at the hospital. And... Uh, the doctor said that and dehydration combined, uh, they think it's what's causing it. Of course, the chemo contributes to that, but he hasn't had a good week this week, so keep Lee in your prayers. Bill and Shelby, keep continue to pray for them and their needs as they are ongoing. Okay. All right, he's had a lot of trouble with gout. 
Okay. Mm. Amen. Amen. Any other qu requests? Yep, Billy Graham passed away today. I'm sure you know that by now. I was talking before the service. We were watching the Good Morning America this morning and they broke in on Channel 9 in Charlotte about 10 after, quarter after 8 with the bulletin about his death and I thought the, it'd just be a bulletin. They'd go back to regular programming and they stayed on till 10 o'clock and preempted everything else and relived his life uh, and played videos of some of his crusades and stuff, interviewing people. And uh, I was sitting there thinking to myself, well, even in death, the gospel of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed and multitudes of people are hearing it, maybe for the first time. And so uh, we know Billy's in heaven with the Lord Jesus that he loved and served. And we certainly pray for the Graham family and for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association and uh, Franklin and uh, the rest of his children that carry on the work that God used him to begin. Yeah, that's right. Just changed addresses. Yeah. And that's true. You know, we... we, we our bodies die, but we don't die. We don't die. We'll be more alive than we've ever been alive. Yep, all the years. I was just a kid in the early 50s when he started his crusades and stuff. And, and all down through the years, all the famous evangelists and preachers that are on TV and that get worldwide recognition... <laughs> Nobody's ever pointed a finger at Billy Graham for anything moral or ethical. His finances of his organizations were always open to audit and everything was done decent and above board. And that's the way it ought to be. Well, they all ought to be that way. Yeah, yeah. well, you can't help them. You know, I heard an old country preacher, B.R. Lakin, said years ago, said, you can't stop them from throwing mud at you, but it don't have to stick. <laughs> so, yeah. Jim, lead us in prayer, would you?
He would raise up a, a, a thousand more men to so be as strong and, and as faithful to his ministry as what he was. So that your name would be glorified and his and the people would be far under conviction, Lord, to know that Jesus Christ died for their sins. We thank you for this church. We ask that you would continue to bless us. Help us to do the things that you call us to do and to get it strength and, and insight and, and knowledge in the things that you want us to do and give us the strength, Lord, to be able to do them. Help us, Lord, to minister to people that are less fortunate than us who see heartache and we see pain and we see suffering all around us each and every day. And may we never turn a blind eye to it. But help us, Lord, to, as Christians to show, show the love of Christ to other people in the actions and the things that we do each and every day. Thank you, God, for what you've done. We thank you for what you promised to do. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We may just pray. Amen. Amen. Don't forget Saturday evening, 5 o'clock. Pinto beans and cornbread. And if you want dessert, bring some. <laughs> Amen. Look forward to our poor man's supper. Turn to page 78 and we're going to sing When We All Get to Heaven. <coughs> All right, if you have your Bible tonight, take it and turn to Psalm 2, the second psalm. I'm not planning on preaching through the whole book of Psalms, but you never know which way the Lord's going to lead you. But I started out uh, a few weeks ago studying in the Psalms, and I thought that maybe it would be good to do a little... Bible study in Psalms on Wednesday nights. It says, Why do the heathen rage 
and the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall He speak unto them in His wrath and vex them in His sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish from the way. When His wrath is kindled but a little... Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. Since the beginning of time, the world has known strife. The history of man is essentially a history of war. In our century, World War I was supposed to be the war to end all wars. About 20 million people were killed. Can you imagine that? 20 million people were killed in World War I. Soon after, the world was locked in another world war, World War II. And World War II claimed not 20 million, but 60 million lives. 60 million. The December 25th, 1967 U.S. News and World Report, I went back a long ways for this. It said in 1967, since World War II, there have been at least 12 limited wars in the world, 39 political assassinations, 48 personal revolts, 74 rebellions for independence, 162 social revolutions, either political, economical, racial, or religious. Now, that was over 50 years ago. I, I didn't take the time to update those numbers. But we have seen wars between Russia and Afghanistan, China and Vietnam, Vietnam and Cambodia, Iraq and Iran and Kuwait and Bosnia. We, we've seen violence in Northern Ireland and, and Peru and Aber... I can't even pronounce that country. Aber... Azerbaijan, <laughs> Panama, Peru, Colombia, on and on. And, and we see in the world today, the Middle East is seething in Syria. They're killing people by the hundreds and by the thousands. One time, Robert Browning, the poet, penned the words that said, all's right with the world. I would probably be more inclined to take sides with the guy who wrote this limerick. He said, God's plan made a hopeful beginning, but man spoiled his chances by sinning. We trust that the story will end in God's glory, but at the present, the other side's winning. I think that's probably closer to the truth, at least on the surface. Man is not in every day and in every way getting better and better. Our world is in chaos. A wife said to her husband, Do you want to watch the 6 o'clock news and get indigestion? Or would you rather wait and watch the 11 o'clock news and get insomnia? <laughs> because it's bad news either way. Should we sink into depression and despair? 
Should we not watch the news? Every now and then somebody says, I just don't watch the news anymore. And, and I'm just going to bury my head in the sand like an ostrich and pretend there ain't no with nothing going on. I don't want to know about it. What are we going to do? When we look at Psalm 2 tonight, Psalm 2 is one of the better known of the what they call the Messianic Psalms. And as I read through it, I hope you could see in those verses how the Lord talks about setting things right and turning everything over to His Son and, and how that they would uh, everyone would ultimately have to submit to His authority. Th this psalm begins with a, a news bulletin announcing a revolutionary international conspiracy, a coalition of kings that is plotting and uh, declaring their independence from the king of Israel, whom God has enabled to subdue and control them. And so when we look at it, we see this revolt of the nations. Why do the heathen rage is the question. If that conjures up in your mind that word heathen, why does the heathen, if that conjures up in your mind a mental picture of a naked savage dancing around a pot waiting on the missionary to be cooked thoroughly enough to eat, that's not what that word means. To the Jew, the heathen were the other nations of the world. And here he says that the, the, the nations are raging. They're roaring like the sea. They're tossed to and fro with restless waves as the ocean is in a storm. In other words, he says, why is there so much international conflict? Why can't the U.S. and Russia get along? Why can't China get along with us? Why does one nation pit itself against another. And all over the world, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in South America, wherever you look in this world, there is an upheaval and there's the nations are raging. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. Now remember now, when the Bible talks about vanity, it is not talking about the amount of time that you spend in front of a mirror trying to make up for the ravages of time. <laughs> it's not talking about that. I, I, I read this little story about a, a man who was sitting on the edge of the bed and he was watching his wife. She was looking at herself in the mirror. And since her birthday wasn't too far off, he, he thought that he would just ask her, well, honey, he said, what do you want for your birthday? And she didn't even look away from the mirror, still with her eyes fixed on her image in the mirror. She said, I'd like to be six again. Well, in a few weeks, her birthday came and he had paid attention, he thought, and so on the morning of her birthday, he got up early and he made her a nice big bowl of Lucky Charms for breakfast. And then he said, honey, I've got a surprise for you. I'm going to take you to Six Flags. <laughs> and they piled in the car and he took her to the Six Flags theme park and man, they had a day. He put her on every ride in the park. He put her on the death slide and the wall of fear and the screaming monster roller coaster and everything there was that he could get her on, he got her on it. Five hours later, they stag staggered out of the theme park. Her head was reeling, her stomach was upset, and he took her to McDonald's and he ordered her a Happy Meal with extra fries and a chocolate shake. <laughs> and then he said, do you know what? To tap cap the day off, said, I'm going to take you to a movie and we're going to have some popcorn and, and some soda pop and, and I'm going to get you your favorite candy, a big bag of M&Ms and, and we're going to have a wonderful time together and they spent the whole day doing that stuff. Finally, she wobbled home with her husband and collapsed into the bed, exhausted and he feeling so proud of himself, he leaned over and he said, well, honey, how did it feel being six again? She rolled her eyes 
And it dawned on her. And she said, honey, you dummy. I was talking about my dress size. <laughs> you see, men, when we're listening, we ain't listening. <laughs> All you ladies I know say amen to that. <laughs> I know she did. <laughs> Vanity. He says, why do the people imagine a, a vain thing? What he's talking about here, this word vanity means emptiness and futility and confusion. Why is there so much individual confusion? The nations are raging, but why is there so much individual confusion? We might ask the same question about the day that we live in. Why, why are so many uh, people, young people and not, not so young people, why do they get involved in horoscopes? When it's pretty obvious, they're 90% nonsense and 10% worse than nonsense. Why, why do so many get caught up in these mystical Eastern type religions? Why, why do they drift away when they're promised some kind of a spiritual bonus? I remember several years ago when Sun, Sun Moon, Moon uh, that, that, that weird guru, he had thousands of young people together in a, in a place and they all got married, you know, married at first sight almost. Didn't even know each other. Promised them a spiritual bonus, uh, something extra that God would give them. Uh, I, I remember going through airports and when the when the moonies were around and, and they'd dance around in a saffron robe and their heads would be shaved and they'd pass out their literature and they were young people, many of them very intelligent, at least worldly intelligent young people. Why do, the, why do the people imagine a vain thing? Spiritual confusion, social confusion, philosophical confusion uh, abounds everywhere. Denise was filling out, you don't mind me telling this, do you? She don't know what I'm going to tell, see. She was filling out a questionnaire. She has to go to the doctor on Friday about her knee. She's got a torn meniscus in her knee. And, and she was filling out a questionnaire and one of the very first questions on there, listen, now this is how it was worded. If I get it wrong, you correct me. I know you will. What gender were you when you were born? At birth. What gender were you at birth? That's on the, on the form for this doctor. That's how things are changing. Confusion. Why, why do people imagine a, a vain thing? And then he goes on in verse 2 and he says, he says, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now in the, in the days of the psalmist, kings and rulers were, were able to exert great influence on people and lead them for good or for evil as they chose. Today's leaders and today's charismatic personalities through mass media are able to influence far more than the old time kings and rulers. Talk show hosts. These talking heads that get on television and, and uh, shows like The View which is a warped view. Wendy Williams and all the rest of them, you get, they get on these shows and they, and when Oprah had her show, they, they get on the show and they promote the philosophies of the devil. They bring on celebrity guests and these movie stars and and I don't know what makes them to be experts in politics or anything else, but they, they listen, they come and they use that platform to promote their heresy. Many of them sit in Madison Avenue offices and promote ideas in million-dollar advertising campaigns. 
They worked feverishly in smoke-filled studios making records, or not records anymore, but making music. And, and our kids download it, and they listen to the words, and they are being indoctrinated in heresy. From penthouses, they plan articles that will hit the newsstands in slick, sophisticated formats. And wherever, whoever today's kings are and wherever they meet, they take counsel together. They consult with themselves. They don't consult with God about it. And so what do the masses hear? The masses hear error instead of truth. They hear what man thinks instead of what God thinks. They learn to adore men and not the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says they take counsel against the Lord. That word Lord there is the word for Jehovah. They are self-sufficient. They are determined. They are independent. And they don't need Jehovah. They take counsel against Him. And it said against his anointed. You know, that's Christ. So self-sufficient men contend in their sins and been in living their own lives. They don't want to know what God has to say about it. It's what thus saith man. And so there's a willful proposition in verse 3. He says, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Get rid of all the restrictions is what they're saying. Don't want no standards. Don't tell me that this is always wrong and this is always right. Don't tell me that marriage is just for a man and a woman. Don't tell me this, that, or the other. Don't tell me that. Don't tell me there, there are moral absolutes. The cords and the bands they want to get rid of are the principles and the standards of the Lord and His Christ. This book, this book, We are told today that Christian morality is out of date. If you have conversations with younger people today, teenagers and young adults, you will find out that many of them believe that the church is public enemy number one. They, they believe that their parents and their grandparents are out of touch with reality. They, they believe, probably like Joy Behar did, that anybody believes God talks to them is mentally ill. Hey, I got news for you. Every time I open this book, God talks to me. I don't go around hearing voices and, you know, that kind of stuff, if that's what they're talking about. But God talks to me every day through this book. But they don't want that. And they rebel against those restraints and they want to get rid of those bands and those cords. They, they don't want anybody telling them how to live their lives. Leave me alone. I've been now preparing some time sermons in the book of Romans. I'm going to preach through the book of Romans. I believe it's the book that we need to hear today. I'm not sure when I'm going to start. In a few Sundays, I guess, but you read that first chapter of Romans. See if it doesn't describe this world we live in today. And, and so it says in verse 4 that he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Did you know God laughs? And this isn't the laughter of comedy. This isn't the, the laughter of joy. This doesn't mean that God gets a kick out of man's rebellion or its devastating results. He says, matter of fact, in Ezekiel 33 and 11, God says, as I live, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. God's laughter is laughter that shows the folly of rebelling against him. It shows us that God has a calm assurance. Listen, when God laughs, as described in verse 4. It's like God sitting there saying, you have got to be kidding me. 
Who is puny man to stand up against God? Daniel 2.21 says it's God that removes kings and establishes kings according to His will. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, almighty Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest ruler on the earth in his day. You remember how he grew proud and, and he attributed his greatness to himself. Look who I am. Look what I've done. And God humbled him with a strange disease and he wound up living out in the fields, crawling on hands and knees and eating grass like a beast. And in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 25, it said that he declared the Most High is the ruler over the realm of mankind and he bestows it on whomsoever he wishes. D do you ever worry that God's not worried about man's rebellion? I'm going to tell you something. God ain't sitting in, in, on the edge of heaven biting his fingernails wondering, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? He lets man go on for a while in his rebellion and then in his anger and judgment he will come and man's proud plans will come to nothing. And so he says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. That, that's, that's a striking passage of Scripture. God... God's uncompromised deity. He is almighty God. And so he isn't worried about puny man and his rebellion against him. God doesn't get his face red and his voice raised and he doesn't allow his feelings to control his anger like we do. No, his wrath is as pure as his love. And he says, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. And he says to them, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. He's already done that which the enemy is trying to prevent. God's anointed is appointed. And he shall never be disappointed. King set them up. But God sets the king up and Jesus reigns and he is both Lord and Christ. And he says, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. In the book of Romans, in chapter 1 and verse 4, it says this. Speaking of Jesus, concerning Jesus in verse 3, concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power. He was declared to be the Son of God with power, yea, even back in the second Psalm. He said, I have declared the decree. This is my Son, this day have I begotten thee. It almost reminds you when Jesus was baptized in Jordan, don't it? And the voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And He says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. It was the custom of great kings to give favored ones whatever they asked. You can read that all through history. So he says here that all Jesus has to do is just ask. And here he declares that even his very enemies become his inheritance. Jesus hath been given a rod of iron and he shall break the rebellious nations in pieces. We read about that in the book of Revelation. And you know, when you read about potter's vessels in the Old Testament, uh, they were never restored if they were broken in pieces. And those who are broken in pieces by the rod of iron that Jesus rules by will be hopelessly lost forever. But I like, I like what we see here in the last three verses. He said, be wise now therefore. 
It's always wise to be willing to be instructed. He's saying that, take time and think here now, you can't win if you're going to fight against God. The, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, doesn't it? So he says, be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Now when he says serve the Lord with fear, I think many times we feel like that means we cower down and we're afraid if we don't do it just right, you know, God's going to thump us on the back of the head or boot us in the rear or whatever. That's, that's not what that means. When he, says, when he says serve the Lord with fear, that word fear means reverence. Reverence. We, we serve the Lord with reverence. And, and, and he says rejoice with trembling. Fear without joy is torment. Joy with holy fear is presumption. But we must learn to reverence God in order to know real joy. Reverence God and rejoice with trembling. And then, then look at verse 12. He said, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way. Did you know that in the Old Testament, a kiss was often the symbol of submission? When someone had been conquered and, and they were willing to serve their conqueror, they would go up and kiss the conqueror. And it was a symbol that they were submitting to that conqueror. He says here to kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way. Be reconciled or perish, I think is what he's saying. The Bible says our God is a consuming fire. So we're to take heed to the terrors of the Lord. And so he says, blessed, well, when, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Can you imagine when it's kindled a lot? Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. Blessed are all they that put their trust. That word blessed means happy. I started off talking about world chaos. And, and war and, and, and world confusion will only continue to increase as the coming of Jesus draws nearer. So we can't escape that, but what can we do? Well, he says, how blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Those that put their trust in Him. Those that run to Him and not from Him. I saw a cartoon. Had a picture of a fearful couple. They were huddled together in bed watching TV. And the announcer is saying in the caption, and that's the news. Good night and pleasant dreams. You know, I thought about that. The only way we can watch the news of this troubled world and have pleasant dreams is if we have taken refuge in our sovereign God who has even the proud rebellion of wicked men under his control. Doesn't matter if it's a Putin. It doesn't matter if it's a Kim Jong-il, a Kim Jong-un. I can't keep their names straight. It doesn't matter. I don't even know who the leader of China is and all the rest. Doesn't matter who they are. God Almighty has not turned loose and it'll all work out in the end. Amen. Let's, let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word tonight. We, we live in a world that's troubled. We live in a world that has all kinds of confusion and voices telling us this is the way and that is the way and this is what you're to believe and that's what you're to believe and this is how you're supposed to act and so on and so forth. 
you have given us your word. You have reminded us that all things have been committed into the hands of your dear son. You have given him a people for an inheritance and you've given him this earth by title deed as his inheritance. And you've given him a rod of iron. And the day is coming when all things will be placed in proper order. But until then, help us, Lord, not to come to pieces when the world's falling apart, but to remember that we serve a sovereign God who's on His throne and who laughs in derision at puny men who think that they can throw off the restraints of a holy God with impunity. We ask for your protection. We ask for your wisdom. We ask for your guidance as we go out each day into this world and try to tell men and women, boys and girls, about a Jesus who loved them and died for them at Calvary. We ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming tonight.